Good morning. I'm Maya Vemrasam, the Delaware Riverkeeper and leader of the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. I'm here this morning to share with you some very disturbing video documenting three dead Atlantic sturgeon within a period of two days, May 8th and May 9th of the year 2025. We're then going to explore what seeing three sturgeon in such a short period of time potentially means for the future of the Delaware River's population of Atlantic sturgeon. I'm honored to be joined this morning by Dr. Dwayne Fox and Dr. Edward Hale to talk about a critical issue um, with the Atlantic sturgeon of the Delaware River. Before we dive in with our questions, um, Dr. Fox, could you just give a brief introduction of yourself? Yeah, Dwayne Fox. I'm a professor of fisheries at Delaware State University, and I have been working on uh, sturgeon for about three decades now, including over two decades of work on sturgeon in the Delaware River. Dr. Hale, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Delaware's College of Earth, Ocean, and Environment School of Marine Science and Policy with an affiliation or a partial appointment to Delaware Sea Grant Marine <laughs> Advisory Service. And so I just want to dive in with a few questions around some critical uh, sections of video that we've received showing some dead Atlantic sturgeon in the Delaware River. Um, so I want to lay the context and then maybe talk a little bit with the two of you about these videos. Dr. Fox, can you describe the status of the Delaware's ri Delaware River's population of Atlantic sturgeon? Yeah, that, I, I'll try, Maya. Uh, so current status, they are listed as endangered under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Uh, there was a status review that was done by a panel of experts that was published in 2007, I believe, and that listed the total number of Atlantic sturgeon was estimated at less than 300, adult, or 300 adults for the Delaware River. A subsequent analysis, a more quantitative analysis that was done by one of our colleagues, Shannon White, uh, posted that number and that paper was published in 2022 and the peer review literature provided an estimate of between 150 and 250 individuals uh, that participated uh, in spawning activities on an annual basis. And so we're presently somewhere between 150 and 250 individuals. I would note that uh, colleagues Dave Secor and John Waldman published a paper that was uh, sort of a retrospective analysis that looked at uh, landings from the commercial caviar harvest back at the end of the, uh, in the 1890s into the early 1900s. And their estimates placed the Atlantic sturgeon at that time uh, at 180,000 adult females. So assuming a one-to-one -one sex ratio, that's a total population size of 360,000 individuals. Uh, as a result, we are somewhere probably less than, uh, you know, one one thousandth of a percent of where we were. So three orders of magnitude decrease in population. And I would I would throw out that Inga Saffron, who's a who's a writer uh, for the Philadelphia Inquirer, published a book in 2002 that uh, is called Caviar, and it's sort of uh, one of the chapters in that focuses on the history of the Delaware River caviar fishery. It's a really great read, um, but but today I think you know we are still suffering from those insults, that huge caviar fishery that took place back then. Um, and Dr. Hale, you and Dr. Fox are out there in the Delaware estuary right now. We're in May of 2025, and so you were out there to witness the three dead sturgeon over a period of two days that people can view in the video. Can you share with people why you and Dr. Fox are out there in the river during this time of year? 
Yeah, so um, Dr. Fox and I have a number of ongoing research projects that are trying to evaluate critical questions for applied fisheries topics. Um, we're both kind of interested in understanding fish species responses, some population dynamics, connectivity, and some of the reasons of potential impact and you know potential mitigation strategies for things that we can do to help prevent localized extirpation. And uh, you know, he and I both spend a lot of time on the water, um, going out and um, trying to sample for fish, and working alongside of um, colleagues from all sorts of different agencies, including Denerec and and. Uh, National Marine Fisheries Service to try and understand uh, what's going on with some of these these populations. And Dr. Fox, can you share with us a, a little bit more about what we're actually seeing in these three videos? Yeah, so the, the three videos outline, and, and this was just complete happenstance. It was part of this uh, survey, this hydroacoustic survey, essentially we go out with a very uh, fancy sonar and we look for large targets, uh, you know, fish that are larger than five feet, and we assign those as Atlantic sturgeon. So we are surveying a uh, portion of the Delaware River from about Tinicum Island, uh, top end of Tinicum Island, down below Marcus Hook, um, which is the area that we think sturgeon are spawning. So we started our survey last Wednesday. I think that's the uh, May the 7th, and on the morning of May the 8th, the second day of the survey, uh, as we were coming, you know, as we passed underneath the Commodore Berry Bridge, I saw, you know, it's pretty characteristic. You see them and you don't forget them. Uh, there was a, a, a floating sturgeon. We turned the boat around and we went by it and I shot the video. And in that instance, the head was removed from the body. It was an adult Atlantic sturgeon. And about two and a half hours later, uh, again, coming through that same general area, the Marcus Hook Anchorage, I saw another animal, um, you know, was floating on the surface. This was a separate animal. Both the head and the tail were, were, were missing. Uh, and so we went by that one. And then on the third day, which I think was Friday uh, the 9th, there was a smaller sub-adult animal that was about three feet in length. Um, that one, I, you know, we didn't, I didn't stop to look at it because we're towing the sonar. Um, but there were no apparent signs of, you know, I, I couldn't see just from where it was floating that it was missing any body parts. But yeah, three dead sturgeon in a couple of days, it's uh, it's not a good, not a good thing. Besides it being so sad um, that you had to witness this um, and experience this, I'm just wondering, Dr. Hale, can you explain a little bit more why it's so significant? given the Atlantic sturgeon populations of the Delaware River, why it's so significant to see three dead sturgeon in such a short period of time on our river? Yeah, I think the frequency is alarming. Um, you can take some of the, the figures that Dr. Fox mentioned and generate roughly what he saw was somewhere around 1% of our spawning population. So it's a fairly significant loss um, to a population that we know is already really, really low. Um, we're not really seeing... Uh, any level of, of potential recovery from any of our preliminary other um, scientific data. And so um, we can kind of couple this. Uh, Dr. Fox and I work together on a joint reporting rate grant. Um, we identify that the reporting rate for Atlantic sturgeon is extremely low, largely because uh, most of the area that's considered spawning habitat represents fairly industrialized watershed. And so um, to have the capacity to actually see these animals, um, witness that mortality event is really significant. We know it's a really heavy hit to the population, um, and it's an unfortunate consequence, and it's one that probably would go unreported. The reporting rate, we think, is is right around 0.08%, so um, really, really low. And so uh, Dr. Fox is witnessing that as a pretty significant um, event in my mind. And before I go on to the next question, just wondering, Dr. Fox, as the as the person who who did witness this, is there anything that you want to add to um, Dr. Hale's explanation of why this is so meaningful and significant? Yeah, I, I would just follow up on what Dr. Hale noted in that you know our reporting estimates are somewhere less than ten percent, around eight percent of the animals that wash up on the beach are reported. And we have no idea of how likely it is that any of these animals that we saw would actually end up washed up on the beach where somebody could find them. So, um, you know, when you when you factor in that, you know, 
animals are killed, some of them float, some of them don't. It's uh, we really don't have any idea the the total impact, but it's it's obvious that something's going on in the system. We're not seeing in the Delaware River. We're not seeing the recovery that other groups are seeing in adjacent systems like the Hudson and the Chesapeake. Both of those systems. And, you know, maybe Dr. Hale wants to comment on it. We're seeing signs of recovery in those areas, and we're just not seeing that in the Delaware. Did you want to comment, Dr. Hale? Sure. Yeah. Dwayne, sorry, Dwayne, for the, the percentage uh, mistake. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think um, as, as Dr. Fox alluded to, we're definitely seeing um, suggestions of potential recovery from some of our side scan sonar data that we've collected as part of another project uh, jointly with some other collaborators, including folks uh, from New York DEC. Um, and so our anecdotal you know, preliminary evidence suggests that there's potentially increases in the number or the abundance. Um, we're not, it doesn't look like we're seeing that in Delaware. Um, there's another good paper by our, our colleague, um, Dr. White, who found from 2009 to 2022, there was 477 acoustically tagged Atlantic sturgeon detected in Delaware Bay, many of them <laughs> tagged by Dr. Fox. Um, however, only really 27 of those individuals moved upstream to spawn. Uh, 14 of those, 27, uh, were actually natal to the Delaware River. So that suggests that not only are we potentially um, not recovering a population, we may actually be doing some level of detrimental you know, action toward other population segments, including uh, James River, um, St. Lawrence River, potentially Hudson River, in terms of other population segments that um, stray and kind of come up to the Delaware River for potential spawning forays. And so just to make sure that we have it totally clear, when you talked about some of that data that you collected with New York DC showing an increase in abundance, you were talking about the Hudson River, not the Delaware River. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, so uh, we have a couple projects. Uh, one of them is on the Hudson River, and it does look like the Hudson River is trending upward. Um, whereas when we look down to the Delaware River, we do not see that same response. Dr. Fox, can you share with us what are the major threats to the ongoing survival of the Atlantic sturgeon population of the Delaware River? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Thanks for that, Maya. Uh, so what what I would the approach I would sort of take is that we break it out by uh, life stage, right? So you have your adult Atlantic sturgeon. Uh, which return to the rivers and they spawn in the rivers. They don't feed in the rivers, but they, they return to the rivers um, and, and they're going to spawn in, in our river. Uh, we also have sub-adults, which are those individuals that are, you know, somewhere a couple of feet long, up to five feet long. And, and those animals are moving up and down the coast, kind of bopping around They're They're highly migratory and they return to the estuary every year. And then we have our river resident juveniles, which are in the river for about one year. And then we have the early life stages, which are the eggs and larvae. And so when you look at what are the threats to uh, continued survival, uh, or, or maybe think about uh, you know, why these animals are endangered, the, there's a series of threats. And I think when we look at the adults, it's really clear that the adults, uh, in, the in-river threats in the Delaware are focused primarily on vessel strikes, uh, you know, so so vessel strikes and or dredging, the, the impacts of dredging, you know, animals get sucked up in a dredge, and then also bycatch and, and, and commercial fisheries. For the sub-adults, it's the same thing where we have vessel strikes and bycatch. When we start looking at river resident juveniles, and, and Dr. Hale has published some work on this, um, you know, when we start looking at river resident juveniles, these are the individuals that are it require a lot, that early life stage requires high levels of oxygen. And those individuals, we see potential impacts with low dissolved oxygen during the summertime. We also start to introduce things like the predation by non-native catfishes. And so, you know, now we have in the Delaware, both flathead and blue catfishes. And, you know, there's a, you know, those animals are going to continue, those populations are going to continue to, to blossom. And unfortunately, I think we're going to see more predation on those early life stages. Um, eggs and larvae uh, of Atlantic sturgeon. So sturgeon are probably selecting areas in the river and they're spawning on rocky bottom substrates in the river. Unfortunately, as those vessels pass over those substrates, we probably get dislocation and disruption 
of, of, an, of, of this, the eggs and or larvae that are in those crevices. And so maybe they get blasted out. Uh, as a result, there's probably increased predation on those life stages. And then, of course, we also have the low dissolved oxygen levels, uh, which have plagued the Delaware, especially in those areas below Philadelphia in the spring and summertime. So, you know, kind of in a nutshell, there's a bunch of threats, but, but that's where I would list things. And Dr. Hale, if people are out in the Delaware estuary and they think they see an Atlantic sturgeon, is there something that they should um, they should do? Yeah, so the state actually has a reporting hotline. Um, they have a web page too with an online reporting form uh, that I can share with mm -hmm. you to, to potentially post elsewhere. Um, but they have a call center dedicated to this. It's 302-735-8663. Uh, and I just really want to um, express tremendous gratitude to the both of you for the incredible scientific work you've done to document the status of the Delaware River sturgeon and how you've brought that information into the public arena so um, people can take meaningful action to fight to protect our sturgeon so we can have population increases in the Delaware and we don't risk losing our Atlantic sturgeon of the Delaware River to extinction, having them wiped away from the face of the earth for forever. Your incredible work and dedication is key to our success to save the sturgeon. Um, and so thank you for sharing the video. Thank you for sharing this information. And I just wanna see if either of you have any sort of closing thoughts you wanna share with the, the people out in the world who care so deeply about saving our sturgeon. You know, my I would just I would kick off just by saying that there's there's hope, right? And so if we look at the Delaware River, short nosed sturgeon, which is the first species, first fish species that was listed under the Endangered Species Act, are doing really well in the Delaware, right? So their populations have come back. Estimates are tens of you know ten thousand adults, and so we have protected their habitat. Their life history is such that they don't co-occur with vessels and other things, and they don't suffer from some of these other risks. So you have a species that primarily resides in the river and they've come back. And so maybe if we just give Atlantic sturgeon a little space, we'll, we'll be able to see that too. So I do think there's a sign of hope. I'm, you know, uh, I think Dr. Hale and I would both say that, you know, you're not in fishery science if you're not an optimist. So Edward, what do you think? Yeah, that's pretty good advice. I uh, <laughs> you have to be you have to be hopeful. I think uh, hard to follow up, Dwayne. I was I was going to let you go last, man, so I could say something like sophomoric, and then you could come in like the elder statesman and correct me. No, um, I I think that's great. Yeah, I I think there's things that we can do. Um, Dr. Fox and I are committed to trying to understand um, species level responses and how best we can help. And I think, you know, we're going to continue to share this information as best we can. Um, and hopefully somebody picks up on it and, um, somebody like you, Maya, and, and kind of runs with it and, and generates some action. Thank you both for caring so deeply or for doing the hard work we need to save our sturgeon. Dr. Fox, were you going to say something? I was just going to say one thing that Ed, I was just going to, one thing is that both both Ed and I are pragmatists, and we both understand that there's a need to balance commerce and human needs with sturgeon, right? And 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 I think you know. So we um, again, we are pragmatists. We understand that, but but we also think that. Uh, and Ed and I have had many long conversations about this. At the time for action, we are we are rapidly approaching a, a sort of a an inflection point, and we've got to do something. Um, so uh, again, if we give them a little bit of space, maybe they'll, maybe they'll come back. I'll just say that. Oh, you may be optimists, you may be pragmatists, but you're also really just amazing people. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you for your work, Maya, too. Thank you.